Good evening, friends. I'd like to welcome you all again to the New Heart Revival Series, coming to you here from Sacramento, California, from the Amazing Facts offices. I'd like to welcome all of those joining us online on the various social media outlets, also those joining us on Amazing Facts TV. Uh, we've had some wonderful responses from those who have been participating in this revival series. We want to thank you for all of your comments and your questions, as well as sharing with us some of the testimonies, how these meetings have been a blessing to you. I uh, just want to shout out to Monica. Thank you for getting in touch with us, Monica. She said, uh, God bless these meetings. These meetings have come just in time. And Sue also contacted us and said, thank you for sharing these teachings. I'm so happy that I found this program on YouTube. So again, a welcome, Sue, as well as the rest of you who are joining us across the country and around the world. The whole purpose of spending time together in God's Word is seeking for a deeper walk with Jesus. We're looking for that new heart experience that the Bible promises. So if you do have a question, a Bible-related question, you can go ahead and send that to us. You can just type your question on Facebook in the comment section. If you'd like to receive this program translated into Spanish, we are doing a live translation, and you'll be able to find that at the Amazing Facts Latino Facebook page. And you can go over there, and uh, you'll hear translate into Spanish. It's also a good time, friends, to... Uh, send out those text messages to your family members and your neighbors and those that you might know and say, tune in, it's live. Participate in our revival series here at Amazing Facts. We also have a free gift we'd like to tell you about. It is a book entitled, Who Do You Think You Are? It's an intriguing title. And we'll be happy to send this to anyone. All you'll have to do is text the word THINK to the number 40544, and we will send you a link to a digital download of the book, and you can read it. Again, the word THINK to the number 40544. And I know this book will be a rich blessing to you. And I think you'll enjoy reading it. And of course, you can share it with somebody else and uh, tell them uh, the blessing that it was to you. Well, before we get to our time of questions, it's always good to start with prayer. And I invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Dear Father, we thank you once again that we have this time to open up your word and study together. A very important subject this evening. We're talking about faith and the importance of uh, faith that transforms our hearts and lives. So, Lord, we ask your special blessing upon this program tonight. Be with those who are listening wherever they might be. And together, Lord, lead us into a closer connection with you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we want to thank you for your many questions that have been sent in. And we're going to go ahead right now. I'm going to invite Pastor Doug to come. And we're going to take a look at some of the questions that have been sent in. Uh, good evening, Pastor Doug. Hello, Pastor Ross. All right. We're ready for some questions. We'll see. Our first question comes from Joy. She says, my husband is a new convert and wants to know, what is the close of probation? Well, you don't find the phrase close of probation in the Bible per se, but the, the teaching is there. First of all, close of probation means your time is up. Uh, you know, whenever anyone dies, their probationary time to choose whether they would follow Christ or the devil is gone. Everybody really only has two choices. He said, you're either with me or against me. Uh, but there's, uh, in prophecy it tells us there's a time in history when probation for the human race is closed, meaning the saved are saved and the lost are lost. And I think in Revelation 22, um, I forget the verses, it also talks about that, uh, where he says, let the just remain just still, the filthy are filthy still, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And so people's cases are forever settled. Life goes on for a little while on earth, but people's destinies are sealed. Of course, if someone commits the unpardonable sin, their probation is closed. As you know, there's a little period of time they may still be alive, but they're beyond mercy, so to speak. And kind of a frightening thought, but uh, it is taught in the Bible. Typically, what we say is the small time of trouble when you can't buy or sell, uh, that, that people can still be saved then. But once the seven last plagues begin to fall, we think of that as when probation is closed for the human race. The saved are saved, the lost are lost. All right, we got a question that just came in right now. Somebody typed in, they said, uh, do you have to be baptized to receive the Holy Spirit? Well, you, some people get the Holy Spirit before baptism. Uh, and, you know, there's plenty of people in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit came on David. The Holy Spirit came on Samson. And uh, they weren't baptized, uh, per se. Uh, but you have in the New Testament the story of Cornelius. He gets the Holy Spirit. But then after he gets the Holy Spirit, Peter said, who can forbid water 
that these should be baptized who've received the Holy Spirit the same way that we did at Pentecost. And that's a paraphrase. So when a person has the Holy Spirit, if they've not been baptized, they'll want to follow the institutes that Jesus has established. That's right. And I think also the Holy Spirit comes in degrees, you might say. Mm -hmm. For example, the Holy Spirit was working in the hearts and the lives of the disciples when Jesus was on the earth. You remember Jesus breathed on the disciples. He said, receive the Spirit. But then we have a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost where they were empowered to go forth and witness for Christ. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit is working upon our hearts. Uh, when a person is baptized and we make that public declaration that we are on God's side, it's as if God's able to even do more in us and through us when we make that commitment. So we had the Holy Spirit before, but God wants to give us a special blessing of His Spirit after baptism. Just like when Jesus came up out of mm -hmm. the water when He was baptized, we read about the Holy Spirit coming upon Him, and He did a powerful work in sharing the gospel there. And, and Peter said uh, in Acts chapter 2, Repent and be mm -hmm. baptized, and you shall receive the gift Amen. of the Holy Spirit. So the special promise of the Spirit that comes with baptism. So don't leave out baptism. Next question that we have is from Suzanne. She's asking a very practical and important question. How do we know if we are saved? Well, first of all, we, we base it on the promise of God. He's declared that if we accept Jesus, his sacrifice for, for uh, our sins, says we can know that we have passed from death unto life if we love the brethren. Mm -hmm. So one way is love. And when you love the Lord and you love your neighbor, when you've had your heart changed, Old things are passed away. All things are made new. You've changed di change directions in your life. Instead of living for self and sin, you now want to live for others in the glory of God. You know, you'll have the fruits of the Spirit, and there'll be a transformation of life. I think you also need to recognize that um, a person that is saved, who gives their life to Jesus, doesn't mean they'll never make a mistake or <laughs> they'll never sin, because the reality is we do fall and we need to come to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. But I think the difference between somebody who is saved and somebody who's not saved is that when we do sin, um, it hurts our hearts, our mm -hmm. conscience are bothered. And we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, please forgive me. It's a sincere desire to live a life that brings honor and glory to God. Someone who isn't saved, they don't really care about seeking the way of righteousness. And so it has to do with the heart. Where yeah. is our focus? What is our desire? And don't get discouraged if you have doubts. Even saved people got discouraged mm -hmm. and had doubts. Okay. Next question that we have. Uh, should you confess to something that happened years ago to someone when they don't remember? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and I might even uh, add something to this. I had someone come to me once. We talked about confession the other day, and that usually generates a lot of thoughts in people's hearts and conscience. And they said, you know, years ago I went around uh, gossiping about this per person and saying terrible things about them, and then I realized that wasn't right, and, and I stopped. Do I need to now go to that person and say, you know, I went around and told everybody all these terrible things about you? Well, that's probably not going to make them feel very good, and I don't see how that will glorify God. Uh, I, you might apologize to some of the people you talk to and say, you know, I was doing a lot of gossiping back then. I hope you'll forgive me. But, uh, you know, I, I think the criteria you sometimes ask, if this is not going to bring glory to God, mm -hmm. and, you know, most of us, you can't go back very far into the past and try to resurrect every mistake you've made. Um, you know, like I said, if you stole your, your neighbor's leaf blower uh, 10 years ago, you may want to still go back and give it to him and confess. <laughs> it's still his. But, you know, you can't always rehearse every word that's spoken. What do you think? Am I saying that right? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and th that I think that's where you need to pray for wisdom. Sometimes you can be uh, overly zealous, perhaps, and actually cause more harm when something was done a long time ago and you prayed about it, God has forgiven you, and, yeah. and you can move on. Uh, you don't want to hurt that relationship. So I've, yeah, I've met people, wisdom. their conscience is hypersensitive mm -hmm. and they can just never have peace. Right. A and uh, at some point, you know, uh, God says, look, I'm giving you a new beginning. Right. Clean slate, go from here, have the joy of the Lord. If we've got to wait until we untangle every, someone said, you can't unscramble scrambled <laughs> eggs. You know, when Jesus talked to the woman at the well, uh, she had already had five husbands. She was living with a guy she isn't married to. And yet he revealed he was the Messiah. She could probably not right all the wrongs in her life. Uh, but she got a new beginning from that point on, and uh, that's where God meets us. 
a question that just came in. Somebody who's watching on Facebook, they asked the question, how do I help my teenager to be more interested in spiritual things? I think this is something that every parent that has teenagers can can yeah, ask. I was waiting to hear your answer. <laughs> 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 I'm asking the question. <laughs> you, you, you've got the answer there. Well, we don't have, now we've got teenage grandchildren. <laughs> um, well, you need, you need to live it in your life. Uh, they say the, uh, the most important thing in raising children is three rules. Example, example, mm -hmm. example. Uh, the other thing is, and I've, I've had some great saints that have had good success with their children. Do things with them. Uh, engage them and model Christianity and act it out with them. And uh, I think that's real important too. You know, I think it's in those early years where the children are still young that you do the very best you can to lay a solid foundation. And then by your example, the way you live your life, you want to demonstrate what a true Christian is. But I think as children get older, I'm talking about older teenagers now, where they start making their own decisions. I think by example, and then also through prayer, we want to do the best we can. But I, I don't think we want to keep nagging them when they're beginning to make decisions for themselves. The good news is, though, if we lay a solid foundation, they might mm -hmm. wonder a little bit, but by God's grace, they'll come back to that foundation that they have. So mm -hmm. we can pray for our teenagers and be the best example that we can be. Amen. Now the question that came in, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48 says, Be he therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Can any human be perfect? Well, let me start by answering that question. Was Jesus human? Did God become a man? Yes. Was he perfect? Yes. So can any human be perfect? Christ was. Has every other human sinned? Yes. But can God uh, give us his perfect character? Um, you know, Paul said, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but I press on forgetting those things that are behind. And near the end of Paul's life, he said, I fought a good fight. I finished the, my race. I've kept the faith. And so uh, I think that we ought to strive for being Christ-like so we have a perfect example. But everybody has sinned. Now, when Jesus said here, be therefore uh, perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, when you read that same passage in uh, Luke, he says, be therefore merciful, even as your Father in heaven is merciful. Prior to that verse there in Matthew chapter 5, he's talking about loving your neighbor, loving your enemy. He's looking for us to have a perfect love for uh, our neighbor and for others. Whenever we talk about Christian perfection, I, I, you know, it's a difficult thing to define. What does that mean? I just say, I know that there are going to be people in the Bible like David, like Daniel, like Elijah, Dan, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, mm -hmm. and Abednego, where they love the Lord so much, they'll put their lives on the line. If we have that kind of perfect love for the Lord and for our neighbor, that's what I think God's looking for. A and in the context, Pastor Doug, you touched on a good point where uh, Jesus is talking about loving your enemies. Mm -hmm. Then he puts that in the context, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. God loves even those who are his enemies. Jesus died to save those he died even for those who aren't going to be saved. He's mm -hmm. prayed for them and said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. So a true demonstration that the Holy Spirit is working in a person's heart is when we can, by God's grace, forgive even our enemies. Amen. And Amen. That's, that's a miracle. We have another question that's come in. It says, where do you think we are at this time of history according to Revelation? All right, well, whatever I say now is going to be different tomorrow. Because at the time of this recording, we're in the middle of a pandemic where it seems like uh, every day freedoms and restrictions are being constrained and the rules are changing and uh, it's a very dynamic situation. A and all I can share is just what I see uh, personally. You know, we talked today in our staff meeting, we're going to have a special mm -hmm. program, uh, not this coming Friday, but the following Friday where we're going to talk about prophecy and where we are now. And so tune in for that. Uh, but right now, it just feels like we're entering kind of a last phase where the whole world is involved in um, making decisions. They're worried about the planet. Men's hearts are failing for fear. There are plagues. There are natural disasters. We see the governments of the world are just constraining freedom. And it's just uh, no man knows the day or the hour, but it feels like we're entering into uh, a new chapter, certainly. I don't think anything is going to be the same after this. Absolutely. Now, of course, Revelation isn't written in a chronological fashion. It's different mm -hmm. themes that are introduced. But there is a few things highlighted in the book of Revelation that tells us as we near the end of time, there will be an increase in natural disasters, but there will also be a rise of religious power or mm -hmm. religious influence. And 
Uh, one of the things we we're just talking about today is how there is a call that's sort of going around the world to allow the uh, environment to rest maybe one day a week. Mm. And we find that rather significant, as you said, Pastor Doug, that's something that we're going to be talking about not this coming Friday, but next Friday. So we are living in some very interesting times. Amen, amen. Well, I think that's all the time we have for our Bible questions for this evening. And again, if you have a Bible question, please type it in there on the Facebook page and send it to us. We'll try to get as many of those questions as we can. We do have our theme song. Tonight we sing in the song, uh, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. And you'll see the words there at the bottom of your screen. And again, we want to invite you to join us wherever you are as we sing this uh, theme song this evening. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face. Thank you so much, Amanda, for leading us in that song. And friends, uh, we are praying for the Holy Spirit to just baptize us during this series where we're talking about how to get the new heart. And we've been dealing with some of the um, high points in the Christian life, talking about uh, faith tonight, we're talking about the Holy Spirit this week, we'll be talking about prayer, we've discussed repentance, confession, and uh, what it means to be crucified with Christ and these are all the, the basic fundamentals of what conversion is all about. And we're really praying that as we study into this issue, with all that's happening in the world around us right now, that a lot of folks will take advantage of this time to get serious about being real Christians, loving the Lord with all of their hearts and all of their minds. And I just want to have a brief prayer with you again as we open God's Word and talk about our subject tonight. Loving Lord, we just turn to you wherever we are as this program is broadcast and streaming live that uh, around the country and the world that we will just seek your face you'll know we're reaching out Lord we want to have the real thing that Jesus came to give us and we pray this in Christ's name Amen faith we're going to talk about mountain moving faith you know I thought I'd begin with an amazing fact after all we are amazing facts and I remember doing a little study on the Bingham Canyon Mine. It's about 14 miles southwest of Salt Lake City. It's the biggest man-made excavation on the planet, and it can be seen from space. Uh, the interesting story behind it is that uh, two brothers, two Bingham brothers, uh, were traveling in the area taking care of some horses back in like 1848. And they noticed there was a bunch of evidence for copper and minerals in the ground. And they went back and they told Brigham Young. And they said, we think we found a mountain that's got just a lot of gems, a lot of ore. Maybe we ought to be working some mines up there. And he said, no, nah, you, you know, you don't have time to be moving mountains. He says, you ought to put your energy into farming. Well, they ended up selling off the property, but it was named after them. And uh, in the meantime, it has been a mine that has been operating for over a hundred years. It is the most productive mine in the world. Uh, every day it moves 450,000 tons of minerals. In 2004, it yielded more than 17 million tons of copper, 23 million ounces of gold, 190 million ounces of silver, and 850 million pounds of molybdenum. 
the value of resources extracted from the Bingham Canyon mine is greater than the famous Comstock load at the Klondike in Alaska and the California gold rush all combined. The metals that were produced just in 2006 at that mine, $1.8 billion. And the brothers thought, oh, we don't have time to move mountains. Well, they really did move a mountain. It's over a half a mile across. No, it's two and a half miles across. It's about a half a mile deep. And it is just this big crater in the planet where they pulled out all of this treasure. You know, we're going to be talking about mountain moving faith tonight. And uh, Jesus, I'll tell you why, Jesus made a statement. In Mark 11, verse 22, he said, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast in the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Now that's a big promise. But what is Jesus talking about? Say to a mountain, be plucked up and moved into the sea? Uh, I remember once I read this in the Bible when I was a baby Christian. I happened to be living in the mountains in a cave by myself. And I thought, well, I want to see how well this works. So I was sitting there from my cave entrance. I could see several significant mountains. And I, I looked at them. I studied them carefully in relationship to each other. This is true. I'm embarrassed to tell you. I had just a childlike faith back then. And so I, I tried to muster up all the faith I could. And I said, move. <laughs> and I opened my eyes. And I thought maybe there was a little movement, but I wasn't too sure. <laughs> and, you know, years later, I realized that uh, Jesus wasn't telling us if we had enough faith, we could move dirt. Uh, God gives us bulldozers for that. He's talking about moving the mountain of sin that is crushing us all. Uh, everybody that sins, it's like the book Pilgrim's Progress. You know, we, we've got this burden and we think, how can I ever get out from under this burden? It's crushing us. You know, one reason I think that, you can read in Micah 7, 19, I think we touched on this in our Bible question time, he will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. So what is it that we moved? need moved? We don't need a mountain of dirt. We need to have God remove a mountain of sin. And uh, some of us have bigger mountains than others, but God is in the business of moving mountains. And through faith in Christ, that mountain can be moved and cast into the sea. And I remind you again that the deepest ocean in the world, the Marianas Trench, is 36,000 feet deep. And the tallest mountain, Mount Everest, is just under 29,000 feet, meaning you could submerge Mount Everest in the deepest ocean and it would be completely covered. You can submerge all of our sins in God's mercy and it'll be completely removed from God's sight. He casts our sins into the depths of the sea and he sets up a no fishing sign. So we're going to be talking about this uh, subject of faith because it is crucial in our salvation. But I want to begin by previewing a story about the promised land. Talking about these 12 spies. So in your Bibles, the story we're going to use as a springboard is Numbers chapter 13. Before they entered the promised land, people had not been there their whole lives. They hadn't been there in generations. They wondered what it looked like. And they persuaded Moses to let them send some spies to sort of preview things, see what the state of things was. And he agreed. And then it tells us the names of these 12 spies. Most of them have evaporated into history. But we remember two of them, Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh. And he sends them out, and it says that in Moses, verse 17, jo uh, Numbers 13, verse 17, then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. And he said to them, go up this way into the south and go up into the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell there are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, whether they are forests or not, be of good courage. He's saying, be courageous, have faith, and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of first ripe grapes. So they went and they spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. 
And they went up through the south and came to Hebron. These are the mountains of Hebron. And Ahiam, Sheshiah, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. And they came to the valley of Eshkol. And there they cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes and carried it between two of them on a pole. And they brought some of the pomegranates and the figs. And it says they returned in verse 25 from spying out the land after 40 days. So they departed and they come back. Now right away you find out when they return there's a big difference between 10 of the spies and two of the spies. Two of the spies get there first. Joshua and Caleb I suspect. I think they're probably the ones carrying this enormous cluster of grapes. And uh, they said the land through which you send us is a land that truly flows with milk and honey and here's the fruit of it. And they begin to toss big old grapes to everybody. You got grapes this big. I was in Australia and I really saw grapes that big. And so they're giving all these grapes to everybody and they're tossing them figs and pomelos and there's probably fruit flies everywhere because they've been carrying all this sticky fruit for days. And the people are rejoicing. But then the other 10 guys who had been dragging along, uh, Joshua and Caleb knew this wasn't going to go well. They brought back a negative report. You see, as they first began to go through the promised land, they looked at the walls of Jericho and they thought, wow, those walls are massive. How are we ever going to conquer a city with a fortress like that? Impossible. Look at the size of their armies. They came to the mountains of Hebron. Look at the size of the Anakim. They're giants. We feel like grasshoppers. How can we conquer a nation like this? And everywhere they went, they just saw all the problems and they forgot the promises of God. The reason it was called the promised land is because God promised to give it to them and they forgot how far God had brought them out of Egypt. Have you ever made that mistake? You forget all the miracles that God performs for you and you wonder if he can finish what he started in your life? Well, those 10 spies show up and they say, oh no, we're never going to make it. You can listen. And it tells you, uh, after they say it's a beautiful land, in verse 28, then the 10 spies begin the majority report. Oh, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the south, the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. How can we conquer these mountains? And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. And all the people began to moan, I suspect, because it says Caleb quieted the people. Why would it say that except they were starting to moan and complain? He quieted them before Moses. He said, let us go up at once. Now he had just come back from <laughs> wandering through this land for 40 days. He's ready to go take it right now. It says, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him says, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land that they spied out. All right, friends, right there I've summed up. Just uh, if you want to know who's going to make it and who's not going to make it. If you don't think you'll make it, you won't make it. If you believe that God can lead you in, you can make it. All things are possible to those that believe. Caleb said, we are able. The other group said, we are not able. And what's really sad is they were all church members. Now, when we talk about taking the promised land and conquering the mountains, having mountain-moving faith, you know, there are people in the church today that says, Jesus just came to give you grace to cover your sin don't really expect any change in your life or victory over sin. Just accept his grace and just uh, enjoy that. And don't worry about striving or fighting or wrestling against temptation or running the race of life. They act like if there's any effort involved in being a Christian, it's a lack of faith. That is categorically not true. The Bible is very clear that faith means that you might need to fight a good fight of faith. Caleb believed they could take the promised land and Caleb was also willing to fight for it. David believed he could conquer Goliath. And he said even when he went against Goliath, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a shield. I come against you with the Lord. His faith was in God, but he had a sling and he had a stone and he had a staff. And so the Christian life is using all of the ability that God has given you trusting God, moving forward, trusting God. But you must surrender all of your human ability to the, to the uh, Lord. You do need to engage your will. You must surrender your heart to him. And there is effort involved. Why does the Bible say resist the devil? 
flee from temptation. And sometimes there's a struggle involved. I think people need to be reminded that part of the conversion is fighting the good fight of faith. But it takes courage to do that. What happened to these other ten spies? Moses said, don't be discouraged. Have courage. Believe. Well, they got discouraged. They looked at the problems instead of the promise. They lost faith because they kept focusing on the negative instead of God's power. Uh, this is really a story that helps illustrate. Oh, by the way, I should mention that uh, if you go over to uh, chapter 14 and you read verse 36, now the men who Moses sent to spy out the land who returned and made the congregation complain against him by bringing a bad report of the land, those very men who brought an evil report about the land, they died by the plague of the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh remained alive of the men who went to spy the land. The two men who believed are the only two that survived the wilderness wandering who were above uh, 20 years of age. They made it that 40 years and entered the promised land because they believed. It seemed like the majority took their eyes off the Lord again and again. And we still have the same issue today. Here we are now. We are on the borders of the promised land. The question is, do God's people believe that he is still a God that can move mountains? So I'm going to go through some points that I hope will help illustrate this truth about faith. I think Augustine said, faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of faith is to see what we believe. Philip Yancey said, believing in advance in something that will only seem logical when seen in reverse. Believe now that you can be a new creature. God told Abraham, he, he called him a father of a multitude before he had any children. And he declared something to be true before it, it happened. And we, you must believe. The Bible calls us saints. We may not feel like saints, but the more we believe that God is going to transform us, the more we act like saints. Unbelief puts our circumstances between us and God, but faith puts God between us and our circumstances. That's F.B. Meyer. Great quote. So we're going to look at some um, points on faith. We're going to talk about the prerequisite of faith, the prevalence of faith, the production of faith, the poison of pessimism, and the perseverance of faith, and then the power of faith. So let's begin talking about the prerequisite of faith. Why is faith so important? You cannot be saved without faith. Now God wouldn't say that unless it was possible for you to have faith. Hebrews 11 verse 6, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is and he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Uh, faith is possibly the single most important element in the Christian life. Anything a person does and attempting to be a Christian means absolutely nothing if he lacks faith. The Bible says, whosoever believeth in him, John 3, 16. It all boils down to believing in God. The words of Christ, Matthew 6, verse 30. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? How often Jesus made a big issue out of a little faith. Matthew 8, 26, he said to the disciples, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? And then Luke 18, verse 8, Jesus said, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? What was Jesus looking for? He wanted to see faith. A weak faith is weakened by predicaments and catastrophes, whereas a great faith is strengthened by them. The reason that uh, Job is mentioned in the Bible is because he was a man who had developed faith before he ever got to his trials. One man came to Jesus with his son, said, Lord, if you can do anything. And Jesus said, if you believe, all things are possible to him that believes. That statement, all things are possible with God, is found about four times in the New Testament. Angel said it to Mary and several times, with God, all things are possible. All things is, really means all things. Mark, I'm um, sorry, Ephesians 2 verse 8, For by grace you've been saved through faith. Habakkuk 2 verse 4, The just will live by his faith. Galatians 3 36, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Romans 5, 1, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope I've made my case, friends. 
that a prerequisite for anyone to be saved is believing in God. We must believe in God. Well, that leads us to the uh, next important point. I'm going to spend a little time on this, and that's the prevalence of faith. You might be thinking, the Lord is making it so impossible by asking me to have this supernatural, extraordinary faith, and I just, I'm not a person of faith. I don't believe that. I believe that everybody has faith. The question is, where is your faith? Now, the Bible tells us this. Romans chapter 12, verse 3, God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And keep in mind, Jesus said you only need faith as a mustard seed, and uh, you can move mountains with this little bit of faith. So we all have faith, but everybody kind of needs their own faith. It's like you know, everybody wants a toothbrush, but you don't want someone else's toothbrush. You need your own toothbrush. <laughs> we had uh, some company came to visit us at our house, and they mentioned they were staying the night, and they said, oh, man, I forgot my toothbrush. And our son said, don't worry, we've got one we share with everybody. <laughs> but we actually didn't have one we share with everybody, but that's what he said. Anyway, um, so the Bible tells us God has dealt to all men a measure of faith. You've got faith every time you sit down that that chair was built well enough to hold you, even though, if we're honest, some of us weigh more than we probably ought to weigh. I have seen Christians go to what we call fellowship dinners or potlucks, and uh, they go through line, and they just take heapings of food. They don't know who made it. They don't know what their kitchen looks like. They don't know what the ingredients are. Now, it's one thing when you shop in the market and you're assuming there's some factory rules, but at potlucks, it really takes faith. And you know what? It seems like just about everybody survives. They've got faith. We have faith every time we put our, uh, our bills in an envelope and drop it in a box that it's going to somehow meet the next destination. I was driving with Karen just this week through an intersection. Said, she said, Doug, you don't have to slow down. The light is green. I said, I always like to slow down and look the other way in case the other guy doesn't see the light. I guess she has more faith than me. But I believe in faith and works a little bit. So, uh, but we use faith all the time. You know, we go screaming through the city, assuming the light is with us. We've got faith that these other people, they say 10% of the people on Saturday night are inebriated. We've got faith that somehow they're going to stop before we get there. So to say we don't have faith, we use faith every day all the time. The question is, do you have faith in God? Do you have faith in Jesus? Salvation doesn't just come by faith. It comes by faith in the Lord. Every time someone was healed by Jesus, you know, Jesus never said, my faith has made you whole. He always said, your faith has made you whole. God has dealt to all men a measure of faith. There is actually, it is scientific fact that there's a power of faith that God has wired in every human. I don't know if you've ever heard about the placebo effect. Right now with this pandemic going, they're testing different medicines and they're giving one group this medicine, I guess it uh, used to be a malarial medicine. They're giving other people just this bitter pill that's inert. It has no value. And uh, they all think they're getting the real thing, but some are getting a placebo. And they want to see how many people actually show significant improvement because they've got to do this test. A lot of people are given a pill and they start feeling better even though it's not the right pill. You know, there are some people, they've done tests and the doctor will rub a leaf on them and say, yeah, we're testing to see how badly you react to this poison ivy. And all of a sudden they break out. A doctor will tell them later, it actually wasn't poison ivy. It's a totally harmless plant. But because we told you it's poison ivy, your body reacted to that spot and you got hives. And in the same way, then the doctor can take cream. And in these study groups, they'll put this totally powerless ointment on them. They'll say, this is a powerful cortisone cream. It's going to take away your itch. And they've got, you know, a rash there. They put it on. And if they believe in the doctor, they believe in the cream, a certain percentage of those people get better. And it's an incredible power that the mind has over the body. And, you know, it's a hard way to prove it, but you've heard of self-fulfilling prophecies. They see that some people that believe things are going to happen, often enough, they often happen. And Jesus said, be it unto you according to your faith. So do you believe that God can save you? All things are possible to him that believes. And so, you know, there's a lot of examples of this in the Bible. And even, you know, I learned an important lesson about the placebo effect years ago. Or bear with me, a little story here. Um, I was in a boarding school on a boat in the Mediterranean. And I joined the school late that year. It had, was already in session. 
And when they drop me off on the school, they take your passport and they, they make search you for drugs and want to make sure that you're clean. And that's back in the days when I was using drugs and all of my friends were using drugs. But on the boat, they didn't want to have take any risks. And so after a few days on the boat, uh, I was thinking, you know, I used to go to these concerts. Of course, I was not a Christian. I used to go to these rock concerts and I'd buy LSD and I'd put it in my wallet. And then I, you'd take this hallucinogenic and some of you are already wondering where I'm getting my illustrations. They think there's flashbacks or something. Anyway, so I'd, I'd get this LSD and it comes in these little form, they call it window pane. And it's like a little piece of plastic, a quarter inch by quarter inch, a little thin sliver. You'd put it in your mouth, dissolve. It's called delisergic diethylamide 25 and then you hallucinate and you have all these wild visions and Anyway, so I was looking through my wallet thinking maybe I've still got some LSD in there I forgot about. And I didn't get any. Couldn't find any. But I got an idea. I'm looking at the little picture holder in my wallet. You know the little plastic things that hold your photos? And I got a pair of scissors. And I cut two little squares. I know this is very diabolical. Please forgive me. There was a friend on the boat named Eric. And he, li he was what we called an acid head. And I thought, I'll trade it to him because... Everybody on the boat wanted the Snickers candy bars. That was one of the only treats we had. So I called Eric into my room and I said, Eric, you're never going to guess what I found in my wallet, which was true. That's where I found it. I said, I found two hits of LSD. And I showed him the two little squares of plastic, which looked just like it. He said, oh, wow, far out. What do you want? I'll give you anything. I said, I want a Snickers. No, I want two Snickers candy bars. I didn't want to sound too eager for one of them. I didn't want to. So I said, I'm keeping one said, all right. So he went and got the two candy bars. He gave them to me. And he left. And I ate them both that night. I don't think I felt very good. I felt guilty and I had indigestion. And the next morning, he came knocking on my door. And I knew it was coming. He said, Doug, you know that LSD that you sold me? I said, yeah. He said, you know, I took it. At first, nothing happened. I said, oh. He said, yeah, but boy, I woke up later that night. And what a trip. And he starts describing all these hallucinations and this stuff that he was seeing and places that he went and I'm going really oh good yeah and then he left my room I swallowed the other one thinking that maybe there were some hallucinogenic properties in wallet sweat that nobody had discovered yet nothing happened but I later learned about the placebo effect he believed he was taking LSD and he had a flashback or something he had a trip because he believed it was a piece of plastic and I started wondering about the power of the mind over the body well, I don't believe we're saved by faith in faith. I believe we're saved by faith in Jesus. And it is not a placebo. It is something very real that happens in our hearts where we are transformed in a tangible way. So there's the prevalence of faith. We've got faith all around us. You know, the two people that Jesus especially complimented in the Bible were pagans that demonstrated their faith in him. You remember there was this woman that uh, she persisted in asking Jesus to heal her daughter. And even though Christ was trying to send her away, he said, um, you know, can't take the children's food and give it to the dogs. He was testing her faith. She said, yes, but even the puppies get the crumbs. He said, woman, great is your faith. Your daughter is healed. He just did that to illustrate something for the apostles. Then there's the Roman centurion. He said, you don't even need to come to my house. And Jesus turned around in amazement and said, I've not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. Two blind men come to Jesus, said, Lord. He said, what do you want? That our eyes may, might be open." He said, be it unto you according to your faith. Now this seems like a pretty tall order. Jesus is telling us that if we have faith in him, all things are possible to him that believes. I'm not suggesting that you go buy a lottery ticket and then have faith you've got the winning number. It's not that kind of faith. The principal thing that Jesus wants to have us learn about the power of faith is that through faith in him, we can have the mountain moved, that we can get victory over our sins, that we can be transformed, that we can become like Christ. The purpose of the plan of salvation, the angel said, you'll call his name Jesus for he will save his people from what? From their sins. God wants us to have faith that we can be saved, that he can transform us. You know, so often the battles in the Bible, you see when they went into battle trusting the Lord, they won. Old Testament's full of battles. People say, Pastor Doug, why is the Old Testament full of war? All of those battles are illustrating our battle with the devil. Doesn't matter if there were 20,000 enemy soldiers and they only had 10. When they went into battle, Samson, 
Killed a thousand with a jawbone, with the Spirit of the Lord. When you go into battle with the Lord, someone once said, you and God are always a majority. And when Jonathan and his armor bearer went against the Philistine garrison, he said, there's no restraint with the Lord to deliver by few or many. They went in faith and they got the victory over this whole contingent of soldiers, two men, because they had faith. So there's this prevalence of faith that we see all through the Bible and the Lord wants us to demonstrate that. Then you've got the production of faith. All right, so there's faith out there and I've got a little bit of faith. How do I grow my faith? Well, the answer is in the Bible. The disciples came to Jesus. They said, Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus said, impossible. You only get so much at birth and that's your quota. That's not what he said. The reason they said increase our faith and Jesus responded is because it is possible for you to have your faith increased. How does that happen? Romans 10, 17. We talked about the Bible the other night and I don't believe I read this verse. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As you read the Bible, your faith will grow, which leads me to another important element in how you can have more production of your faith. Look at the story of David, David and Goliath. So when David says to King Saul, I believe that I could whoop the giant, the king said, he is a soldier from his youth and you are just a youth. What makes you think you can beat him? He's twice your size. David said, well, I've just got blind faith. That's not what he said. David said, I've got evidence for my confidence. When I was taking care of my father's sheep, a bear showed up and God gave me the strength and the spirit to kill the bear. And then later, a lion came to get the sheep and God delivered the lion into my hand and through God's faith, Working through me, I killed a bear, I killed a lion. True, they're smaller than the giant, but I've got evidence, and based on the evidence of what God did for me with the lion and the bear, I believe that he can help me kill the giant. When the Lord brought the children of Israel to the shores, the borders of the promised land, hadn't the Lord given them evidence to believe? Look at all those incredible plagues that came on the Egyptians and how God provided water out of a rock and bread for heaven and victory over the Amalekites. He had given them evidence for their faith and that's why they were without excuse when he said to that generation, you can't go into the promised land because you just don't believe. And friends, uh, that's something, I, it's kind of a sobering thought, but I don't want to rush past it. Those that did not believe that God could bring them into the promised land and give them victory did not make it into the promised land. You must believe that your Jesus is bigger than your devil. Nobody has a problem having faith in the devil. Everybody glorifies the devil all the time saying, oh yeah, the devil got me to do this and the devil got me to do that. And, the, and you know, they just take it for granted that the devil is going to have his way in their life. But when you say, well, don't you think that Jesus is bigger than the devil? Doesn't the Bible say greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world? And so through Christ, we are able to get the victory and conquer and overcome these mountains. So you can have more faith. Matthew 17, verse 20. Assuredly, I say to you, if you've got faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you However, this kind does not go forth except by prayer and fasting. So read the Bible, you get faith. Look at the evidence of God's leading in your past and it'll grow your faith. And prayer will grow your faith. So when you pray and you get answers to your prayer, your faith gets bigger. Have you ever prayed before for something that was just really extraordinary and then God answered your prayer and you go, wow, why would I doubt God? He's so powerful. He's answered so many prayers before. Faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. All right, well, at this point, I want to talk a little bit about the poison of pessimism. You can read here where it says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, When the tempter came to Jesus, he said, If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, what did he say? If. Uh, for the devil, everything is about an if. You know, when Christ was hanging on the cross, there was that 
thief on the left. And he said, if you're the son of God, save yourself and us. And uh, the high priest, when Christ was being tried, he said, if you're the son of God. So the word if, uh, it obviously denotes some doubt. And so God is not wanting us to have doubt. He's wanting us to have faith. James chapter 1, verse 6, when someone comes to the Lord and they're wanting deliverance, he said, but when a person prays, let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Some of us need to pray and say, Lord, forgive my unbelief. Uh, start believing that God can. And, you know, I think it's important for us to uh, speak positively to those that are around us. So many Christians are, are negative to each other. We need to encourage each other that we can do all things through Christ. Abraham Lincoln said, We complain because roses have thorns, but we ought to rejoice that the thorn bushes have roses. And uh, that's several variations of that have been quoted. So not only do we have um, the production of faith to avoid the poison of pessimism. Uh, so don't be constantly rehearsing disbelief. Then there's the perseverance of faith. Faith is not something that just happens in a moment. Faith represents a persistence. They were 40 days exploring the promised land. Even though they saw, they saw that the, the giants were bigger, they saw the walls of Jericho were bigger, they saw that uh, they had you know, better weapons. Uh, the people in the promised land, Cal Caleb and Joshua, they saw that, but they persisted in believing in God. They hung on. Faith persists. You know how you move a mountain? An ant can move a mountain. One grain of sand at a time. You just got to persist. 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. It's a, it is a fight. It's a battle. Lay hold on eternal life. Now, the language that Paul is using there He's kind of talking about like when Jacob got a hold of the angel and he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Take a hold of the promises of God. Lay hold of them and get, reach out for the horns of the altar and just plead for mercy. Sometimes we give up so easy. Pray persistently. The perseverance of faith. 1 Peter 9, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 5 verse 9. Speaking of temptation. Resist the devil steadfast in faith. Be steadfast, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You're not in this battle alone. Every Christian is constantly striving to maintain our hold on God. This life, as long as the devil is out there, it's going to be a battle. You could either surrender, and then you basically sacrifice eternal life to the enemy, or you can fight the good fight of faith. And I'll tell you, it's a lot better fighting against the devil, working with the Lord on your way to the promised land than being a slave back in Egypt. And how often the children of Israel said, oh, we wish we were back in Egypt. 1 John 4, verse 4 and 5, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. What is it? Our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Your best friend is the creator of the universe. Why would he say no in giving you anything you needed to succeed in being saved? Jesus wants you to be so, saved so much, he gave his life that you might be saved. Why would you doubt that he wants to save you? Believe he wants to save you. Believe that he will help you. Now sometimes God tests our faith. He'll bring you to the Red Sea and you'll think, wow, I don't know how I'm going to go forward. And then he'll make it real interesting and he'll put a mountain on either side and then it gets real interesting and he'll have the Egyptians charging down your neck and then he says, do you still trust me? Then, at the last minute, he parts the ocean. You know, God is looking for people that will refuse to give up anything. They're going to continue to hang on with their faith. You know, um, mountains can block your vision, but God is in the business of moving mountains. I was interested reading the history of Hannibal uh, back during those Punic Wars about 200 years before Christ, he knew he had a better army there in northern Africa by Carthage. I was at Carthage when I was a kid, when I was sailing around on that boat I mentioned earlier. And uh, 
But he couldn't fight the Romans on the sea. You know, Italy was a peninsula. They had a better navy. He said, I'm going to win if I can fight him by land. And he thought of something that was such an audacious plan. He said, well, I, they're not expecting me to come by land. To do that, I'd have to come from the north, which means I need to land in Spain, march my army up around by the Rhine, cross the Italian Alps, some of the biggest mountains in Europe. Oh, no, it's the biggest mountains in Europe. With elephants. And... He had um, 38,000 infantry, 38 elephants, 8,000 cavalry, and he started in September. And it was quite a struggle crossing those mountains, but he believed that he could do it. He did something that seemed impossible to everybody else, and he's believed now to be one of the greatest generals in history, very educated man, because he wasn't intimidated by the mountains. Spurgeon said, A little faith will bring your soul to heaven. A great faith will bring heaven to your soul. Faith does not, George Mueller, who's a great man of faith, he said, faith does not operate in the realm of possibility. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. You might say, Lord, I'm helpless. I can't do it. That's when you really give God permission to roll up his sleeves. Our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try one more time. You've heard the expression, and that, by the way, is Thomas Edison, who wasn't a Christian, but he made some good statements. Someone said, triumph is the combination of try and oomph. Sometimes Christians forget about the oomph. There is some effort involved in being a Christian. You've got to wrestle sometimes in prayer. And uh, this is a great quote by Bernard of Clairvaux. Only by desertion can we be defeated. With Christ and for Christ, victory is certain. We can lose the victory by flight, but not by death. Happy you are if you die in battle, for after death you'll be crowned. But woe to you if by forsaking the battle you forfeit both at one time the victory and the crown. So many people give up and, and they say they, for a little temporary relief they sacrifice to the devil. Friends, and then there is power in faith. Uh, when you believe, all things are possible. You know, I didn't give you the rest of the story. You can look in the book of Joshua. In chapter 14, Caleb is 85 years old. And he comes to Joshua. They conquered a bunch of other nations. And Caleb says to Joshua, you know that 40 years ago when we were spies, I believed that God could lead us in. And I saw these mountains where these beautiful fertile soil, the southern exposure, and the springs in what we now call Judea, the area of Hebron, better known as the mountains of the Anakim, where the giants lived. Caleb said, I'm 85 years old now, but I am as strong now for going out to battle, for coming in. And then he makes these famous words. He says, give me this mountain. He believed that with faith he could overcome a mountain. Joshua blessed him. Caleb led the children of Judah. They conquered the giants. And the reason the Jews settled in where we now say Jerusalem is is because that old man had faith that he could overcome mountains and giants because all things are possible with God. You know, I want to tell you a quick story, and I think uh, Karen will find this, boot this up on the screen. There's this incredible man, Dashrith Manji. His wife died while he was rushing her to the hospital, but he had to drive 40 miles around this rocky ridge. And he, they kept pleading with the government to put a road. It was only three miles to the hospital if they would just cut a road through this rocky mountain. And the government ignored him. So after he lost his wife, he got out one day with a pick and a chisel and a shovel and he began to hack away at the mountain. And everybody thought, that poor old guy lost it. He's crazy. Well, he was young then. But he kept at it. Pretty soon people felt sorry for him and they gave him tools. Then they bring him food. Day after day, rain and sunshine, he beat at the mountain. He hammered the rock piece by piece. He hauled it off until after 22 years he had carved a road 25 feet wide, uh, over a nearly 400 feet long, connecting the two towns that's now used by 60 villages today. That man moved a mountain because he would not give up. And you know what he said? With God, you can do all things. Became a national hero. Single-handedly moved a mountain. Friends, don't underestimate what you can do. Don't give the devil the glory. Jesus said that he can set you free. He can save you from your sins and cast that mountain into the depths of the sea. Do you believe what Jesus promises? 
I pray the answer is yes. Let me close with prayer. We may go off the air as we're praying. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the promise in your word that all things are possible with you. And we pray, Lord, that you'll bless each person that's watching now that they might take hold by faith of your promises and experience that victory. We thank you and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.